case you forgot, Pastor, we're in Genesis. Oh, good. Thank you. I was wondering where we were. That's right. All right. Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the wonderful gifts that you give us in your word and sacrament. Help us by these gifts to remain faithful and steadfast in you uh, until the day where you call us home or until our Lord returns. Bless us in our study of Genesis that through this our faith may be strengthened. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so before we begin, does anyone have any questions today? <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment. That's why I keep asking. Chrissy, did you have something? I have a question. Yeah. Just this morning I, I saw an ad for Answers in Genesis, and they, they want a donation. And I thought, well, that's, you know, Chuck and I like getting some kids things, and, you know, we mm. you know they support the curriculum. So uh-huh. What's your thought on Answers Oh, my thoughts on answers in Genesis. Um, in general, they, are, they have a lot of good stuff. Um, they, they do a really good job in, in, you know, in this creation evolution, looking at all of the arguments and kind of putting forward an, ex, an explanation um, to how you know, science and you know, the, the stuff that we have discovered do in fact point to God existing and creating it all. Um, they, they do a really good job of that stuff. Um, now, of course, they're not Lutheran, right? So they get, they get things wrong, and, and you, have, you have to watch out for that. Um, but in general, yeah, in general, they, they have a lot of good stuff, and it's, it's good for us to, to kind of look at that, because they've done a lot of that research into that. And so it's, it's easy to, you know, read what they have to say on that versus you having to <coughs> dig into all of it. Um, because they that's what they do for a living so so yeah in general very good always read you know with that critical eye you know put your lutheran lenses on and you know pick out any you know bad things but in general they're pretty good yeah what was the question? uh my thoughts on answers in genesis um it's like a it, it's a well they do a lot of stuff um ken ham is the kind of the head um, and he, he has this, yeah, this organization, you know, Answers in Genesis. And basically, it's, they look at all of the stuff that, you know, evolutionists and people who disagree with the Bible, all their arguments that they put, you know, against Genesis. And so he then, you know, from the b- biblical perspective, you know, talks about creation. And they have a magazine. They have different curriculum that you can do for Sunday school and Bible classes and um, yeah they they had they put out you know videos on YouTube and they they have a bunch of different content and it's all kind of under the umbrella of answers in Genesis Um, and so that was the question yeah yeah any other questions this morning yeah when did Catholics split into Luther? Why did they split? Um, so the, the reason, um, so in the, in the 16th century, uh, Martin Luther was, before he became, you know, Lutheran, so to say, um, he was a Roman Catholic monk. Um, so he was in the Roman Catholic Church, he was teaching in it, and, and he was reading the, the Bible, and saw that there were places in the Bible that contradicted practices, certain practices that the Roman Catholic Church was teaching on and, and doing. Um, so one practice was the, the selling of indulgences. An indulgence was, yeah, kind of a question look. Uh, the indulge, an indulgence was this piece of paper that said, if you pay so much amount of money to the church, to the Roman Catholic Church, then you would get a certain amount of time out of purgatory, which I should explain purgatory first. There's a lot that goes into this. Purgatory is the Roman Catholic teaching. It's not in the Bible, but it's this teaching that um, basically, in their perspective, you know, 
God gets you started on this Christian journey, and then you live your life doing good works to try and earn your salvation. Uh, and then when you die, you know, there, there's, you're, you're trying to reach 100%, and let's say you get to 85% of salvation accomplished in this life. Then you go to, this, to purgatory, which is like this intermediate state of, of somewhat suffering, it's like hell, but you get out of it, I guess. Um, and, and so you spend some time there to finish up your salvation. And then once, you, once you've served your time in purgatory, then you go on to heaven. And so Luther was reading the Bible and he said, this is nowhere in the scriptures. You know, in the gospel lesson today, right? The thief on the cross who's dying says, you know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus doesn't say, Okay, well, once you've served your time in purgatory, then you'll be with me in paradise. No, he, he says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. So, so purgatory doesn't exist. Um, and we can't buy our own salvation or buy our you know, limited time of suffering or whatnot. Christ does it all for us on the cross. And so Luther wanted to, to start this discussion with the Roman Catholic Church. He said, you know, this stuff isn't in the Bible, so let's talk about it. And the Roman Catholic Church said, no, you're a heretic. We don't want to listen to you. And so they kicked him out of the church. They tried to kill him. Um, it was a whole big thing. This is where we get the Reformation from. And so, yeah, so the reason why Lutherans became a thing was because the Roman Catholic Church didn't want to talk with Luther about these points where they were in conflict with the scriptures. And so Luther then, you know, brought the gospel back to the people. He translated the Bible into German so the people could read it. And, and so, then, um, so then, because the Roman Catholic Church would not change, he, he, you know, then the, what we now know as the Lutheran Church started. Um, so that people could worship in the truth and have the true teaching. So, so it, all, it all centers around that, that argument over, you know, what does Scripture actually teach? Um, that's, that's where it came from. Yeah? Didn't he see in, in the Bible where it started with the Lutherans that the just shall live by faith? Was that where it started with him? Um, I, that's certainly part of it. Um, one of the big passages that we look at is when it says that, you know, you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, Ephesians 2. Um, that, w that was a big one, right? Because it's like, hold on. Like the Roman Catholic Church is teaching that I'm saved by my works. Yet St. Paul is telling me here that I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by faith in Christ. So, I mean, that is a big text to, to point to and that Luther saw and was like, hold on. Like this is... It's not matching up, right? And and so um, yeah, and so uh, and there's a, there's a t you know a multitude of texts that you know Luther came across that that show this kind of inconsistency in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but yeah, that that we live by faith, that we're saved by faith in Christ. Um, so you know this is one of the solas of the Reformation, right? Sola fide, by faith alone, uh, that we are saved. Right, yeah, you can't buy your way into heaven. Christ bought your way into heaven by the shedding of his own blood, and so now you don't have to. Not that you could in the first place anyway, but yeah, absolutely. Where and why did the notion of purgatory come into being, and how did money get attached to that? <laughs> those, those, those are great questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Ha, ba yeah, ha, ha. <laughs> it was a fundraiser. It, yeah, it, it it really was. Yeah. Cookie dough. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the Don't forget. Don't forget, we're doing a cookie dough fundraiser for the church. <laughs> Salvation is not attached to it, though. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, who, when, how, why, purgatory. Um, I don't really know the origin of like how it started. I mean, obviously it originated within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, yeah, w one of the big reasons that we see is because they wanted to build all these cathedrals. And 
what was a great way to do that? Get people to donate money, right? And, you know, and so, so I, I don't know if that was the initial, like if, if, it, if it started off as that, with that bad intention. Um, but but it, at, by the time of Luther, it, that was a big reason for indulgences was, you know, the Pope has all of these building projects to build these beautiful cathedrals. And they were beautiful cathedrals, but they cost a lot of money. And so one of the ways that they got money from people was through the, in, the selling of indulgences and that idea that you could, you could save time out of purgatory for yourself or even for others, right? You could pay money so that your, your grandma wouldn't have to be in purgatory for as long. Um, again, you know, there, there are some passages in Scripture that talk about, um, like, that by, like, th- like a refiner's fire that you're, you know, um, that, you know, like someone who's, you know, purifying metal, you put it in a fire. Um, I, my guess is that those are the texts that they would look to to see, well, look, see, you have to go through this purgatory time to be purified. And we say, no, that's, that's not talking about a purgatory or a place you go to after death. Um, but, you know, rather that's, you know, living in this life, right, and, uh, and whatnot, the, the testing of your faith in this life. So, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of the origin of, you know, who started this teaching of purgatory and if it started off with that fundraising idea or if it was, you know, a genuine misinterpretation of scripture that morphed into uh, this fundraising thing. Um, so I, I'm not 100% on that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not really in scripture and, and yeah, and it certainly goes against a lot of the teachings that are very clear in scripture. Um, you know, one, one of the, um, one of the theological interpretive moves that, that we use, um, hermeneutics, this, you know, the interpretation of scripture is that when we're looking at passages, uh, we, we, look first and foremost to the clear passages in Scripture. Um, and, and we always let Scripture interpret Scripture first and foremost um, because it's all the Word of God, so it's going to be better than us trying to come up with something. And so, so when we come across clear passages, like you're saved by grace through faith, not by works, pretty clear. Okay, great. You know, that, that is, we can, we can all understand that. Then when we get to passages that are, you know, maybe not as clear, um, that there might be some confusion, the first step that we do is we say, okay, well, let's look at the clear passages of Scripture and let those be the primary interpretation for the passages that, you know, aren't clear, right? And so, so with this purgatory thing, like, what is this refining fire, this, you know, to be purified, you know, is, is that a time that we go, you know, into purgatory for a time after death? Um, that, you know, if you define that as an unclear text, right, we, we go to the clear text. And the thief on the cross is a very clear text where Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, St. Paul says, you know, it's better if I, that I, it, it would be better that I would die and be with the Lord, right? One, two. Um, it's not die, serve my time in purgatory, and then be with the Lord. So that's another clear text. So we look at these clear texts Uh, that don't speak of purgatory, don't speak of this, you know, time period between death and being in heaven. Uh, And so then we we look at those and say, okay, so purgatory is not a thing. So so then we have to look at, okay, what else could that text mean? And then you kind of, you know, you dive into it that way. So, Cora? Right, right. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That practice of, of yeah, putting m- money with the deceased, you know, to to cross, you know, cross the river Styx and and you know, pay pay the gatekeeper to, to bring you in. Um, yeah, um, it, it's possible that that's what it is. What it kind of stems from. Um, I would like to think that they would have at least tried to get it from the Bible. Um, you know, best construction on our Roman Catholic brothers. 
Um, but yeah, um, it's possible. I, it, 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 it might have some different origins, and I'm, I'm just not sure as to where it started. So it's possible, but yeah, who knows? So either way, it doesn't exist. I've always considered it like a detention hall, Catholic detention hall. All right. So those of, you, those of you that are in school, if your teachers try to give you a detention hall, say that's purgatory. Pastor says that does not exist, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> All right. Oh, boy. Good sound advice. Wow. You have a great or what? <laughs> and remember, we're Lutheran. I think there's something else that L stands for too. <laughs> Oh man. If if it's if it's Catholic detention, does that mean that the rest of us are off the hook, right? It's it, maybe it's just Catholics that go to purgatory and the rest of us are spared from it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, you know, Saturday Night Live years ago did a scientific study and it was determined by Dana Carvey that God's favorite religion was Lutheran. Oh yes. Yeah. yes. Of course he is I, a Lutheran. I, I believe that, yeah. Oh yeah. All the apostles were Lutherans, right? <laughs> It's true. It's true. <laughs> oh man. If if you're getting your theology from Saturday Night Live. You put no stock in the church lady. The 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 jury's out on that one. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah, well. That, that tends to happen in this class quite a bit. <laughs> Ask the pastor was more organized than Sunday morning Bible class. <laughs> oh, man. Any other questions this morning? <laughs> Please no. <laughs> I, I, I did see it. Do you have a question? Uh-huh. I sure hope so. I hope that today we're with the Lord in paradise. You know, if G Jesus comes back right now, it'd be great. It's one less service I have to do today. I don't have to field any more questions. Talk about paradise, man. No. <laughs> and, and if he's listening to this discussion, we're all in purgatory. <laughs> yeah, if, if it didn't exist before, it definitely does now, right? Just for the Holy Cross Bible class hour. Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey, that, that's true. That's true. <laughs> All right, any other questions this morning? All right, good. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've, we've served our time. All right. Maybe question time is purgatory, and now we're moving into the good stuff. All right, so we are in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, we covered the first uh, five verses last week, the first day of creation. Um, and I wanted to touch on um, just, you know, the, the creation of light just real quickly before we move on into the second day. Um, an argument that you will always hear from um, either, you know, atheists, evolutionists, people are trying to disprove creation, or from Christians who, who, you know, are wrestling with this, is, okay, so we see, you know, in the days of creation, right, light is created on the first day. You know, God says, let there be light, and there was light, evening, morning, you know, um, and there was the first day. But the sun and the moon and the stars, the, you know, the sources of light that we think of, aren't created until day four in creation, right? So people will say, oh, well, look, see, you can't have light before the sun. And so, you know, obviously this whole thing is just a sham, right? And, or, or the days are in the wrong order and, and it's written incorrectly and so you can't trust this. Um, it's not true. I mean, it is true that the sun and the moon and the stars were not created until day four. So they were not the sources of light on day one. Um, and so the question then becomes, where did this light come from? Well, you know, if, if one is, you know, 
even somewhat familiar with the descriptions of God. You know, what is he described as? Light. 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 He is the light of the world. Uh, light of light, you know. Um, and, and then, in, you know, in, in Revelation, right, in the new creation, you know, the new Jerusalem comes. And, and you know, by this point, you know, everything in, in heaven and earth, the, the sun and the moon and everything has been destroyed. And now we have this new creation, the new Jerusalem, and it says there is no night in, in the new creation. Um, and, and, and the light comes from God. And so I would say the same thing was happening in the first three days of creation, that God was the light that, that shone upon his creation. Um, and, and, and that's where that light comes from. It is, is, is the glory of his light that, that shines over. Um, and so then, then he, you know, then on day four, right, he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And, and right, notice what their purpose is. Right, we'll get there. But their, their purpose isn't necessarily to, to light creation. The, the purpose of the sun and the moon and the stars is for, you know, times and, and you know, to tell the time, to have months and years. And, and you know, this is how God establishes his festivals and the feast days. It's, it's by these, you know, the, the stars and the moons and, and all those things. Um, this is still how we tell, you know, when, when we calculate when Easter is going to be. Um, that's why it moves around, all right? It's not just a set day that we have every single time. Some of our feasts are like that. Um, and so, right, that's, that's their purpose, really. And, you know, God does use them to, to shine light upon us. But these, these, the, the easy answer for, for the light being present in these first three days of creation are that God was that light. Um, and he's described as that time and time again. Um, he's described as that in, in John 1, right, which is a very, John purposefully connects the language to creation, right? He says, in the beginning was the word, just like Genesis starts, in the beginning God created, right? And in there, he describes him not only as the word by which everything was created, but he is the light of the world that shines in the darkness. Um, and that's exactly what we see in the first day of creation. So, you know, so while, while we can't necessarily understand that, you know, we, how, you know, how is God light and, you know, trying to wrap our brain around that. If, if we look at the words of Scripture and how they describe God and what he does, right, we could, it, we, it's an easy answer to point to. It won't satisfy your atheist friend or your, you know, your person who denies the existence of God, right, because they're going to say, well, God doesn't exist, so how could he be light? It's like, well, we believe that he does exist and he is light. So, um, so, so you know, that, that's our answer, right, is that God is, was the light. You know, he, the light radiated from him. This is why people couldn't look at God, right? It's just this brightness that, you know, people, you know, hit the floor when they, when they see God. Yeah, he had to have, Moses had to have a veil over his face because he was in the presence of God and he was just like glowing. <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we, we give our answers and we share it, and, you know, it's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to create faith. And a lot of this stuff, right, is kind of more, you know, apologetic in nature, right? When, so when people are qu making you, you know, question creation and say, well, how could you believe in creation when we have all of this? And this is, this is what it says in, in the, the text, right, that there was light before the sun. That just seems, you know, infantile in nature. How could you believe something like that? And so, that, you know, to, to defend your faith, right, you don't have to convince them, but you can say, well, it was God. It, it, the scriptures describe God as the light of the world. So, I mean, why, why couldn't he be the light? And, you know, they, they yeah, they won't accept it, but that, that's, our, that's your answer for, for, for that question. Yeah.
Yeah, right, yeah. It, it, yeah, it very, if it was written to make sense, then, you know, to try and convince you, then, then they would have put, okay, obviously the sun would have been created first, right? And then the light would come from the sun. Um, but that's not how it was. That's not how God, you know, gave it to Moses to, to put down. Um, yeah, a very, a, a very easy question to, um, to give to people to, to kind of feel out where they are in, in regards to creation versus evolution is to ask the question, do you believe that plants existed on this earth before the sun was cre- before the sun existed, before there was that, you know, sunlight? Um, and, you know, anyone who doesn't hold to six day young earth creation account is going to say, no, that's silly. You have to have the sun first so that it can give the light so that the plants then can pro- do, you know, do photosynthesis to produce, you know, the, the sugars that it needs to live. Um, but that's not what Genesis says. Genesis says that on day three, I believe, um, that plants are created. There are plants of all of its kinds with seed and its fruit and outside and whatnot. Um, but all of the plants exist on day three. Um, and then the sun is created, right? And so, you know, that'll, you know, blow scientists' minds if they won't accept that God created everything in its order and that God is the light that shines upon the world and that God upholds his creation by, by his own word and his own power. Um, but to, to, to see, you know, where people stand, that, that's a good thing to point to, um, because once you start messing, you know, saying that, oh, well, maybe the days were in the wrong order, right? You're, que- you're questioning the word of God. And it's like, God put it in this order on purpose because that's how he did it. Yeah. So, yeah, would, would God be one of the brighter stars? Um, we would say no. Um, so, so when we say that God is light, um, it doesn't mean that he is, you know, a star or, or something like that. Um, he, he, the light radiates from him. Um, but, you know, God, apart from the person of Jesus, he, God is immaterial. He's spirit. Um, so he's not like a, a physical thing. Um, except for Jesus. That's part of what makes the incarnation so spectacular, um, is that this God who is, who is immaterial, he's spirit, he is not, you know, physical, uh, becomes flesh and blood, becomes a human being just like us. Um, and so, so we wouldn't say that God is even, even one of the brighter stars off there, that they, those would all be creations, um, uh, of that that he made, um, but he himself is is not a star. But he did create those stars and created stars that were yeah brighter than our own sun and all of the universes and you know all of the pictures that we see from the Hubble telescope and all those things of universes and universes. Right, God created all of that and he created all of it for us. Right, he created it so that we could look at it and see it and then give glory to him. It says, wow, he created all of this stuff. That's, you know, what an amazing God. Yeah, he, he is the, the source of, of, yeah, those lights, all lights, the, all, of everything, right? And that's what light of light in the creed is talking about, light of light? I, I think so, yeah, in, in the creed, yeah, the God of God, light of light, um, that, yeah. Of the light. Yeah, that, that he, he is, you know, that Jesus is begotten of the Father. He's of the same substance of the, as the Father. And so he is, he's the light of light. He is God of God, very God of very God. You know, begotten, not made, right? He wasn't the first creation that God made, as some heretical, you know, religious bodies will believe. Um, but, but he is, you know, God himself, um, and he is the, the source of, of that light. And so, um, yeah. And, and again, right, so a lot of this stuff, right, is, you know, can maybe confuse us logically, or, you know, we're trying to think through all of this and be like, okay, well, you know, think about the stars and the light and, you know, where it came from and, and whatnot. Um, but, but a lot of that, you know, we, we, we believe by faith, right? We, the, it says it in the word of God, and so we believe it. Um, 
And, and so you know, it, it's good to think about these things, but it, we also don't want to get caught up too much into it because God is beyond our understanding. If, if we could completely comprehend God and understand God, he probably wouldn't be worth worshiping because we are sinful. Our, our mind is corrupt. It's not perfect. Uh, we fall short daily. And so if with our own sinful fallen mind, if we could completely grasp everything of God, then, then it would show that he's not perfect and he's not really as, as great as we would say he is. And, you know, why worship someone like that? Um, but, but he is far above us, far greater than that. And that's what we should expect of a perfect, eternal, divine being. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of imagery in, in the scriptures. Um, and, you know, we, we don't always, um, and, and we always want to, when we're reading those, those images, right, they, they, that's what they are, they're images. Um, and so when we talk about reading the Bible literally, um, we, we talk about, you know, and there's, there's, there's really two definitions to that word literally. There's, there's literally in the sense that, I am going to take things, you know, word for word, as it says, you know, and, and so when, you know, so if, if you take literally in that sense, right, you look at Revelation and you see the, it says there's going to be locusts with lion's mouths and scorpion tails that are going to, you know, run over the earth. If you're talking about that literally, like as it says in the text, that's what's going to happen, you know, that's one way of looking at it. We don't read the Bible literally in that sense. Um, but literally can also mean according to the type of literature that is used, right? So Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's filled with images and symbolism, and right? And so when, when we see, you know, dragons and beasts and, you know, all these locusts with all these different heads and tails and whatnot, you know, we can say, okay, well, this is, you know, imagery um, that is often connected with Old Testament, apocalyptic literature that is good to compare um, but we we don't we wouldn't say that okay there's going to be these weird locust things that are going to you know flood over the earth but that there are symbols of of the demons and evil and and whatnot you know whatever you get into um, and so right when we see the the imagery that's used that you know like jesus as the morning star um, right that we we can say okay well he he's not literally a star right because he is he is the son of god and and if it uses like or as right that's simile metaphor kind of thing um and so right we we say okay well he how how is jesus like a morning star right that he he is you know the the first fruits he is the you know the light in the darkness that you know like there's darkness at night and then the the morning star the morning sun comes up and then there's light. That's you know Christ shining in the darkness, right? And so, um, and so, so a lot of that imagery serves to point to you know how Christ functions and and what he is like. Um, you know when when Jesus says you know you know I I am the door, right? You know he he's not saying he's a, he's a, a wooden door that's you know walking around and you know. Um, but he, he is the, the, the gate, the means by which you enter into paradise, to be with the Father. Um, you have to go through Christ, which I think is actually, I mean, that's baptism, right? You're baptized into Christ. Um, and so it's by baptism that you enter through Christ, you go through that door, and, and are able to go to the Father in, in paradise. Um, and, and so... Um, so, so the, we, all, we always have to be careful with the images, right, and, and what is Jesus or what isn't he. Um, but, but, that's, but there are a lot of images that are tied to Jesus that, we, you know, that are helpful to, to look at and think about and look at, you know, show the different functions that Jesus lives out in his life.
Who? That's a, the second question. It's a big one. Um, so the yeah the <laughs> the, the first question. We're, we're not going to get to Genesis today, folks. Um, so 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 the, yeah, that, that first point, right? That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chapter three. We're, we'll get there. Um, yeah. Spoiler alert for chapter three. Um, yeah. So yeah, the star of David, right? Um, the, is that is what it you know the Bethlehem star is kind of what it's referred to, um, and you know that was what led the the wise men uh, to Jesus. Um, that they they followed the star, which was a divine star, right? It, scripture says that it, it it moves and and leads them, right? So it's not just some you know I would say it's not some natural star that just you know that that this is this is a star that is cre- you know created and does something unique than any other star, um, which is why I think these wise men could you know follow it, um, and that it was shining you know pointed them to where Jesus was. Um, but yeah, but it's, you know, it's the star of David, right? It's the, the town of Bethlehem, which was David's, you know, that, that's where all of the descendants of David went. That's why Joseph and Mary went there, because Joseph was of the line of David. And so everybody who was of the line of David went to Bethlehem. Um, right, because the census was taken. Right, exactly. And so, and, and, and because there was, you know, yeah, there you know, all dif- different wives and lines and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that, yeah, God had Caesar, you know, yes. do the census in order to get Joseph back to Bethlehem to fulfill the scriptures that Christ would be born in you, O little town of Bethlehem, right? Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where the, the name of that star originates from. And the, as an aside, the star of David is six points, which represents the six days of creation, the icon itself. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah, I, I had never heard that, but that, that sounds good. <laughs> the, 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 the six-sided star of David. The six days of creation. There we go. I, even I learn things every now and then. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And so there, there, in, in a lot of pictures, there, there is the the four pointed one where it's like a, it's like a cross. Um, which, yeah. So it, it doesn't say in the text like what exactly how many points. It, so it's all kind of like artwork, right? Interpretation of it. Um, so however you want it to be, however many points you want it. Um, the, the second question is a big one. Um, why, why does God, God let evil things happen? Well, it's important to note that God did not bring evil into the world. Um, like we said, it, we'll, we'll see this in, in Genesis chapter 3, um, that you know God creates Adam and Eve, he creates the garden, um, and he tells them, right, he creates the, the tree of the, uh, the, of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and he says, right, don't, don't eat of it or else you'll die, right? Otherwise, they'd live forever, right? They'd, they'd eat from the tree of life and, and all the other fruits, and they would live forever in paradise, and it would be grand and glorious. Um, but as we'll see in chapter 3, spoilers, they eat the fruit. And this is by the temptation of Satan, right? He comes in. And, and tempts Adam and Eve to, to eat the fruit. He says, well, God's lying to you. God's not, you know, he's trying to keep this great knowledge from you. Um, and so it's by Satan's temptation and Adam and Eve's uh, disobedience to the word of God that sin then enters the world. Um, and so from that point, right, sin is passed down through humanity um, for, for all of us. This is why we are sinful. It's because Adam and Eve were sinful. And it's passed down through that. Um, and so, so this is where evil comes from. Um, you know, God then states, you know, the, the consequences of, of their sin, right? Now that, you know, women are going to give birth painfully 
um, and that they will be in subjection to their husband. They'll, they'll desire authority over their husbands, but, that, but their husbands will rule over them. Um, men, when they are, you know, when they are harvesting the fields, there will be, don't even talk about that. <laughs> we'll get there when we get to chapter three. She got that one wrong. I'm just telling you. She got that uh, anyway, one. anyway, quiet down in the peanut gallery. Um, <laughs> Um, I told you this was all pent up. You were gone for too long. Um, So that, you know, Adam has to, you know, he was working in the garden and, you know, there's plenty there. But now when he's working the ground, it's going to be by the sweat of his brow. It's going to be hard work. It's not going to be enjoy, you know, enjoyable, you know, only. Um, And and that there's going to be thorns and thistles. It's, you know, stuff that's going to make it difficult to do that job. Um, And then, you know, the, you know, the serpent, Satan, is, is cursed, and, and, you know, we get the great promise that Christ is going to come and crush his head, and, you know, that Satan will strike his heel, um, foreshadowing of the crucifixion. Um, and so this is, this is where evil originates from. Um, and so, the, you know, then we move on to, right, we, we see the effects of sin, all around the world. You know, this, this is where natural disasters come from. This is where, you know, the reason why people die is because we are sinful people. Um, if we weren't sinful, we wouldn't die. But we are sinful, and the punishment for sin is death. And so that's why we die. And so, you know, all of the evil that we have, right, is, is because of our sin. And so when it comes down to it, right, if, if we were honest with ourselves, Right, all of the evil that happens in our life, right, we it is a result of, of sin in this world. Now, now God in His great mercy spares us from you know certain things and will bring us out of, of this evil. Um, but we still live in this sinful world, right? And that's 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 one of the reasons why we look forward so much to the day of the Lord when Christ returns. Because there's going to be that complete separation from, from good and evil. Um, yeah, exactly. That they, you, no longer will, will evil be around us at all when we are in the new creation. And so, right, that's, that's why we pray, you know, come Lord Jesus. Because when he comes, we the faithful will be, ta- all evil will be, will be moved away from us. And we will be in complete paradise. As to, as to why certain God lets certain things happen, um, you know, Job asked this question when um, in the, the, the Old Testament book, Job, he, you know, he has everything taken from him. Um, and he asked God at one point, you know, why, why did you do all of this to me? And his answer was, uh, God's answer was not necessarily a satisfactory one, um, if we're being honest. Um, he, he tells Job, right, were you there when I created the heaven and the earth? Were you there when I did all of these great acts of creation and, and all of this stuff? And Job says, no, I wasn't. Um, well, he doesn't actually give an answer, but, um, but God is like, no, you weren't. And so don't question the way that I act. Um, yeah, and... Mm-hmm. And if God intervened every single time we made a bad choice, that doesn't even die with Scripture also. So I think that's why bad things happen. Is that we yeah, we, we have a free will, right? When, when God created Adam and Eve, he didn't create them as robots that would always 100% you know, follow the will of God. They had the opportunity to either continue in the goodness that, that God had given, or they could disobey and... And you know, eat the fruit and see what happens. And so, so you know, so, so there is that that choice there. And then, you know, from that, of course, we are all sinful. So we, there's no way that we can be perfect on our own. And consequences come from that. Um, but we don't, because we do not cause bad things to happen because we're sinful. Life happens, and in order to, we don't all live forever. And right. Some die, some don't die. Some mm-hmm. have accidents and car accidents. It's not because we 
did something wrong that we had a car accident. I think that's a horrible way to look at life. Well, it, we can cause evil, right? I could go, I could go out and run over somebody with my car, right? And that's and that's not passive. I, you know, I was that is my sinfulness going and causing death, right? That that is evil, and and I would, you know, be held to judgment if if I don't repent from that. And so, right? It it is, it is. It's it's Satan's fault. It's man's fault that there's sin in this world. It is not God at all. No evil comes from God. And so we, you know, we don't like to talk about ourselves being sinful and evil. Um, but, you know, if, if you look at the, sin, at the world, right, people are not inherently good, right? This, this, was, this, was the, this is a debate that has happened throughout history. Are people, are human beings inherently good? And when left to their own, they will do good things? Or are they inherently bad and if left to themselves they will do bad things and the answer that scripture gives us and the answer that history gives us is that people are inherently evil um, because of sin right saint, saint paul romans 3 no one is righteous no not one there is not one person besides the person of jesus god in the flesh who is who is good and who is perfect and th this is why we continue to see murderers and criminals and, you know, no matter what laws are put in place, people commit evil, right? And so, you know, we, we don't want to think of ourselves as evil, but apart from Christ, we are. The punishment for sin is death, and so we are evil. It's only by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in us that we can do anything good. Well, yeah, that's, that's true, right? It's not like, yeah, punishment against you that because I'm sinful, something bad happened to me, right? But it's because other people are sinful or we live in a sinful creation that, that evil things can happen to you, right? Um, it's the disregard of God's will. And, and I, I, I had to answer this question numerous times throughout my career. Why did God allow this to happen? God did not allow this to happen. This is the result. This is what happens when men turn their hearts and minds away from God. Then this is the result. We have sin. We have violence in the world. We have crime in the world. And people act evil, evilly. I mean, with, with great malice and great evil. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I don't know how to explain it or why to explain it. The simplest way I can, I can answer the question is this. Like standing at ground zero when I was there, somebody asked me, How did God allow this to happen? If you're such a believer, how did God allow this? Well, this God didn't do this. Mm -hmm. Evil men did this. Evil right. men that had turned their hearts and their minds away from God. Right. And as a result of that, this happened. Evil men did this. God did not do this. This is an act of man. Mm -hmm. This is war is an act of man because mm -hmm. we can't behave ourselves. We can't get along. Why? Because we're sinful mm -hmm. and we are inherently evil. There's evil in every one of us. If pushed to the limit, if pushed to the limit, each and every person in this room is capable of great evil. We don't perpetrate evil on others because we recognize it as bad and contrary to God's instruction and God's will for how he wants us to live our life. Mm -hmm. Which you know, brings so. us to the question of choice. Yes. We have the decision to make. Yeah, it's the just, people who did 9-11 had a decision to make. They made a bad choice. That's man's free will going in the wrong direction. It's not God creating it. Mm -hmm. We try to stay on the path that Right. Yeah. We we. Good thing that we do is with the help of God. Yeah. Every good thing is is only done by the fact that God is working in us. Um, because even our good deeds can be can have an ulterior motive that we're not even aware of. Right. You know. 
Yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, it's a good thing to get on somebody's good side. Right. Even though the good thing is a good thing. Right, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, when, when you, you can dive into, you know, yeah, the, the motives and the mind of, of humanity, right? It's, it's not a good place to be. <laughs> Um, you know, lo- looking into the heart of sinful man, right? It's, it's not good. Um, and, and it's only good by the grace of God, right? We, we are dead in our sins, right? That's, that's a, you know, St. Paul uses that language very purposefully. It's not like, you know, we are, you know, because of our sins, we are weaker and, it, and, it, and it's harder for us to make the right decisions, but we still have the ability to make the right decisions and follow God. Because of your sin, you are dead in your sins. A dead person can't make any decisions. A dead person can't decide, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go help this lady across the street. Dead person can't do that. Only people who are alive can, can make decisions and move and act. And so in our sinful state, we, you know, we, can't, we can't do anything good. It is only because we have life that we are able to, to live and, you know, to decide to do things that are pleasing to God. Um, otherwise, we, we would be dead and, and there would be no hope for any of us. But, but Christ, Christ has given us life. Uh, he has, you know, died for the world and the Holy Spirit works in us. And it's only by the Holy Spirit that we are able to, to, to live God-pleasing lives. If, if the Holy Spirit was not in us, we would never want to do anything truly good. How many times in the Bible do do, uh, people, believers, and others say, well, if I'm dead, how can I worship you? (laughs) Well, they they don't say that, um, but they they do very much confess that that only God can, that he he, he is the source of all goodness, that he is is the the life of, of the Christian. Um, and so, right, he, he knows that, that God is with him, and that's what enables him to, to, to go and worship. If, if he didn't believe in, in God or, or anything, then, then he would not go to the, the tabernacle and, and worship or anything like that. Um, it, it all stems from God. So e- even our own ability to do what we consider as good comes from God within us, right? We're, we're coming up on Thanksgiving and everybody's like, oh, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for these things, right? The, the amount of things that God gives you goes so much deeper than what you even realize, right? The, the fact that you are living and breathing right now is a gift of God. The fact that you even have the slightest desire to be a Christian is a gift of God. E- everything is a gift of God that is given to you. And so, right, so this is why, you know, on Thanksgiving Eve, you know, we, we come and we give thanks to God. And on Thanksgiving Day, right, we don't just forget about God. We always give thanks to him because he is the one who gives us all of these good things. And, and yes, there are hardships in this life and, and evils that happen. Christ doesn't shy away from that, right? He says very clearly, in this world, you will have trouble. He doesn't say just because you're a Christian, you're going to have an easy life. In fact, he says the opposite. He says, because you're a Christian, you're going to have a harder life because the world hates you, because the world hated me. Uh, But he says, fear not, I have overcome the world, right? Christ, by his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave, has, has defeated sin, death, and the devil. And so while, you know, this is why we are both saints and sinners at the same time, right? We're, we're, we're still in our sin. We live in the sinful world and we face consequences, you know, temporal consequences for our sins, but we are also made saints in Christ by his death on the cross, by baptism into his death and resurrection. And so as we go through this life, as we pass through, you know, the valley of the shadow of death, right, we, we don't need to fear. Why? Because we know and trust in the promises of God and we cling to those, knowing that, that God works for us and has saved us uh, by his cross. And so, um, so, so, you know, evil things will happen. And, and that's something that we have to, you know, wrestle with and, and strive through. And it's not something that we can, you know, grasp completely. We're, we're never going to always know why did God let, you know, why did this evil thing happen and God not stop it? Um, we don't know. 
And, and there may not always be a reason, right? We always want to say, oh, yeah, well, God, you know, is going to work good through this. Well, it could just be the, that this is the reality of sin and it's evil and it's going to be hard for you. It, that, that is the, the hard reality. Um, but we know that God has worked salvation for us and, and that we cling to those promises. He's going to return. He promises to end evil forever, uh, which is why we pray that that day would come. All right, last thought, and then we got to close. Yes, sir. Is it, is it wrong to think that God chose you to be his child if you're a Christian? No, that's how you're a Christian. Uh, we, you know, to, to, I'll, I'll talk about this more next week. Um, but this goes into the idea, the, the biblical teaching of predestination. Um, um, that God chooses the elect. Um, and Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so we'll, we'll talk about that next week because I have service in two minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so let us close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the great conversations and discussions that we have in this class. Uh, we pray that through these things uh, that you would bless us and strengthen our faith and um, help us to grow closer to you. That when we inevitably face the hardships and difficulties of this life, uh, that we would fall upon you, fall upon your promises that you have saved us by your Son, and, and that you have granted us life uh, and everlasting peace uh, in our baptism, in the Lord's Supper, in all of the wonderful gifts you give us. So remain with us and keep us steadfast in your word. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.